I'm Katie Massad, and this is Flute Unscripted, candid conversations with musicians, makers, and masters. I sit down with a new artist every week and share their uncensored stories with you. You're listening to Season 1, brought to you by Flute Center of New York, the exclusive marketplace for flutes. Join us and subscribe. And please stay tuned to the end of the episode for a special Flute Center of New York code for our podcast listeners. Seemingly out of nowhere, Damari McGill has quickly become the next IT flutist. A recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant, Damari has dominated the audition circuit, holding principal positions with the Florida Orchestra, San Diego Symphony, Santa Fe Opera Orchestra, Seattle Symphony, and Dallas Symphony. Damari has also been acting principal flute at the Pittsburgh Symphony and most recently at the Metropolitan Opera. Damari is currently maintaining a jam-packed schedule. He has returned his principal flute at the Seattle Symphony, he has stepped in as a visiting assistant professor at CCM, and he continues to travel the country giving masterclasses and performing concerts. I snagged a few minutes with Damari on his latest trip to New York City, where he gave the New York premiere of Kevin Putt's Flute Concerto at Carnegie Hall. Thank you for coming in and stopping by. Oh, this is easy. Yeah, this is easy. Your your schedule's not busy or anything. It's you're fine. Not, no, oh, really? Actually, it's a, oh, that's okay. Days. No, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only thing I was doing today was practicing. Oh, good. So much music to learn. Yeah. But um, this is a good, healthy break. Good. Well, I'm glad you took the break <laughs> to come and sit down Thanks with for the me. invitation. Yeah, yeah, well, we all uh, know you for all your accomplishments and everything you're doing now. You're very busy. Um, how did it all start for you on the flute? How did it start? Yeah. Um, well, uh, it started actually before I was born. Um, <laughs> I, when my parents were dating, um, they would, you know, they would have parties. And they would have they would have jam sessions at these parties, and my father would play like a wooden African flute, and my mother would sing, and my mother eventually bought my father a a used uh, silver plated flute, <laughs> you know, just for fun with some books and. Um, by the time I was seven, I, I, I found the case, I was collecting dust at that point, um, in, the, in their closet and, um, you know, asked my father, you know, how do you, what do you do with this? How do you put it together? How do you play? And he said, you just blow across it like you blow across a, a Coke bottle. And I just, I, I love that story. It's just funny how a, a gift from a girlfriend to a boyfriend mm-hmm. can change, change someone's life, life yeah. you know? That's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. And is your whole family musical then? Um, I would say that my whole family is creative. Mm-hmm. Um, um, when my brother and I were growing up, both of you know our, our both of our parents were were art teachers in the Chicago public school system, and um, my father ended up switching over to the Chicago Fire Department. <laughs> um, but he's he's very creative, very creative. Um, our mother is um, it's just overflowing with with talent with um uh with musicality i mean she's a great painter as well she uh, she sings beautifully mm-hmm. she acts um and i think that we got a a little bit of that did your parents want you to be musicians or just yeah. pursue the arts as a hobby um they wanted us to be passionate about something, to commit to something, and to be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, there was never ever a push to be this or that, um, but there definitely was a push to be something. That was the big thing in our house is, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how often the answer changed. Um, so music was one of many things, you know, like gymnastics, mm-hmm. taekwondo, art class, and uh, music is the thing that that we fell in love with. New York, you're, you're here now. Um, mm-hmm. This isn't a new city to you. You're pretty familiar, right? You went to Juilliard. I did, yeah. Um, you were playing at the Met. Uh, how's it feel to be back now? What do you love about New York? Oh, it's um, it's a great, great city. It's a great city to live in. It's a great city to visit. Um, I love the energy. Um, there's always something to do. I love the food. Um, it's a very inspirational place, mm-hmm. very inspiring. Um, just, just energy of just random people. I don't know. I, you know, I get a lot of good practice done here. It's not uh, distracting for you. 
Do no, that. it's motivating yeah. for me. Because so, I think there's a benefit sometimes to those schools that are out in the middle of nowhere is mm-hmm. that the benefit is there's nothing to distract you and you can just kind of hole up in a practice room and get a lot done. But then there's lacking the cultural inspiration. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I I guess maybe the moral of the story is that you can find inspiration anywhere. Mm-hmm. Here, I get it from the people, um, you know, elsewhere. I don't have any problems practicing in Seattle. Um, where where I live or anywhere that I'm mm-hmm. visiting, but I I enjoy this city. And when you were at Juilliard, you studied with Julius Baker. I studied with Julius Baker mm-hmm. at Juilliard. and Jeffrey Kaner. Right? Um, well, I studied with Jeff Kaner at, at Curtis. Oh, that's right. But I still I still <clears throat> took some lessons once in a while with him. I um, uh, they they were both my teacher. Yeah. You know. So. What was your big takeaway from Julius Baker? A lot of his students have kind of like a a big cornerstone of their playing that they can attribute to his teaching is there something that you took away from him sure there were uh definitely uh more than a few things that i carry with me you know daily um that were inspired by uh or um mr baker i mean really um there was there was one lesson in particular that was really really important for me i don't think he intended it for me to learn this particular lesson, <laughs> but I think about it constantly. And the lesson uh, when I was first at Curtis, I was 17, and I hadn't practiced a lot of this particular week. So, and we, <laughs> he, he liked to hear a different piece every week. Um, so I went to the library, I picked out uh, uh, Kaplan's. Did he tell you your repertoire every week, no, or you picked it yourself? We picked it up out and rehearsed with the pianist and performed it for him. So I, I went to the library. I was looking for something easy, so I picked um, Caplay's Reverie, Reverie and Petite Boss, and thinking that it was easy. <laughs> and um, really, I embarrassed myself in the lesson. And he just—he uh, was kind of staring out the window, and he looked at me. He said, oh, "Just sit down." And he—he he said, "Yes. Where are my glasses?" I said, "They're in your head, Mr. Baker." He said, "Okay. So where, where's my flute? It's on the piano, Mr. Baker." And he picked up his flute. And right before he played through the piece, he said, you know, this was, this was a piece I loved playing right in this room when I was getting, you know, when I was studying here with William Kincaid. And, um, and Kincaid loved this piece as well. I said, well, man, lucky me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? um, and he played through the work. And, of course, it was really, it was spectacular. The playing was am- am- amazing, uh, amazingly beautiful. Uh, but even more than that was this sense of nostalgia that that I took from his performance of it that that um, really got me thinking of how can I create this kind of atmosphere when I play? I don't mm-hmm. think he was intending that, you know, he just wanted to let me know how the piece goes. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I took away so much more than that in this sort of atmosphere, this mood um, that I felt um, you know, in his, his performance of this Capelet work, I still think about to this day of how can I create this atmosphere and affect a listener mm-hmm. in, in that way. Do you think about that before every piece that you play? And how do you set the stage and set the mood? Well, um, yeah, that's an, an, an important part of it. I, um, you know, I think it's so easy to forget that... Um, we can really be poets with our instrument. It's, it's fun to focus on the craft, mm-hmm. uh, to focus on the fingers and the tongue and, you know, even on, you know, projection, the sound, all it. But these, I, in my opinion, are all just tools to, you know, to inspire, to make someone's day. Mm-hmm. Um, Not to, to lose sight of the bigger picture. Right, yeah. is that we're learning the the instrument to um, in order to sing, mm-hmm. not j- just not to, to master double tonguing. Right, that's just <laughs> a, a tool. Right. The recent principal flute openings at the Metropolitan Opera have featured a dramatic turn of events. Upon dual chair holders Denis Boryakov and Stefan Haskoldson's departure, an opportunity to fill in for a season presented itself, 
and Damari was one of the new acting principal flutists. It was assumed that Damari would continue in the role after the Met held auditions in 2017 for a permanent position, so it came as a shock to his fans and followers when he did not receive the appointment. Where others might feel defeated or cheated, Damari views the whole situation with an extremely positive attitude, viewing each new opportunity as a chance to better himself, learn, and grow. What was it like to play in the Met in your first season there? Well, um, playing... Playing, being acting principal at the Met for a season was spectacular. I had a, I had one goal um, when I even auditioned for the one-year spot. Um, if I were to win it, then I felt that having, even if it was just one year in that musical environment, um, I would progress me. It would, I would grow as a musician, as an artist, from being around the singers. And that's what I was looking for. I was looking for, um, for growth, you know, mm -hmm. to simply get better. And I feel it's, it was it was it's very it's a very luxurious concept to not go someplace for the job, but to go someplace to learn. Yeah. And um, and you have that if you have that opportunity, especially in. Uh, such an amazing classroom like the Metropolitan Opera being around such great instrumentalists um, playing some of my favorite music um, and hearing really the greatest singers in the world these voices day in and day out how can you not grow so it's it's an experience that um, I'm grateful to have had mm -hmm. and I definitely got what I needed and hope for out of it and a lot of times I feel like we're trying to mimic the voice when we when we play are there any any tools that you got from that experience that opened your eyes to why we're always trying to mimic singers or anything that you any revelations that you might have had um sure you know it was um it's how how careful and how um I guess in tune they are to uh, what their body is doing to produce the uh, their ideal sound, and um, you know we do concentrate a lot on on our instrument when their instrument is their body, and so I I I started to do more of that, just being aware of of. Um, how my body is actually serving my concept of of sound of of you know of projection of, of music making mm -hmm. um there was that but also just on a very basic level um if you listen to enough opera not you don't even have to be in the middle of the of the metropolitan opera orchestra for this to happen but if you listen to a love enough vocal music uh you'll start to hear the voice in all of the works that you, instrumental works that you're playing. You know, you pick up a Mozart concerto after playing some Mozart operas, after listening to Mozart operas, you can hear, wow, yeah, he's, this is, this is operatic music. Mm -hmm. Even um, Tchaikovsky in, in, in an orchestra, you play a Tchaikovsky symphony. Um, after playing a Tchaikovsky opera, you know, I'm hearing, obviously hearing more than the, Tchaikovsky violin concert in my head. Now I'm hearing these, I'm hearing um, how he wrote for the voice and how even his symphonic works are so vocal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm grateful for that. And after these latest auditions that they have, I think a lot of the flute community was kind of surprised that you didn't continue on with the Met. Were you surprised? And how did your audition go? Were you, were you well, happy? Was I, was I surprised? I will say this much is um, that um, and I can't stress this enough, is that I, well, there's two things, is that I came here to learn, and but I wouldn't have come here if there weren't other audition opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I, so there, it's, both, both of those statements are, it, it, were, were extremely important in my decision to come here in the first place. So um, in the first part of it, as I have mentioned, I learned a lot. Mission mission accomplished. Right. That's um, enough right there. That's enough yeah. right there. 
So, and I was able to win another job. Yeah. That's enough right there. I've, I've been happy everywhere I've been. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I played in the Florida Orchestra in the, based in the Tampa Bay area, um, the fact that it's, you know, it's considered a small orchestra didn't stop my growth. Um, that was actually, while I was in the Florida Orchestra, I won an Avery Fisher career grant. Mm-hmm. So this idea of, of being in a particular orchestra for just for the prestige doesn't really mean anything to me. Mm-hmm. Um, because as long as I'm growing, then I am uh, maxing out my um, ability to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. And so was I surprised? Abs- was I surprised that I didn't win an audition? Absolutely not. Winning an audition is impossible. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it's absolutely impossible. If you're able to win one, um, then you're fortunate. If you're able to win two, then you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, I've won about four or five. Yeah, so you're very So... <laughs> Surprised? Absolutely not. Um, you know, thrilled at what I learned from the year? Totally. Mm-hmm. Um, excited to be back in Seattle? Yeah. 1,000%. I loved it the first time I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I love my colleagues. It's a wonderful orchestra, wonderful city, and wonderful hall. And I get to make music day in and day out. Um, it actually is that simple for me. Can we talk a little bit more about the career grant? Um, mm-hmm. How is that chosen and how did that change your career? Well, I re- remember the, the day that I got uh, the call stating that I, I won this Avery Fisher career grant. There were a couple moments in my life that I've had this. It was Avery Fisher career grant and there was the Sphinx organization um, mm-hmm. uh, like award of ex- excellence where you get a random call saying that um, you won this award and, you know, <laughs> where can we send the check? I, <laughs> what everybody I, dreams about. I mean, yeah. it is, it's surreal. It's, um, so you, had, it, you had, were not expecting it. No, I wasn't expecting it. All, really, I mean, I just simply have tried to keep going. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. all that I've, I've done in my in my musical existence. I mean, um, of course, there's ups and downs, but um, yes, I mean I, that's that was a big surprise to get the, those calls. But it was in a, a, in the context of of me just you know enjoying my job in Florida, um, doing still having a connection in, in New York via Chamber Music Society twos. Um, program for you know emerging artists but um, yeah I definitely felt lucky lucky but um, I don't know I just feel that if you're if you're you're hungry enough and you're passionate en- enough you have the right attitude and you find happiness within yourselves then um, luck finds you mm-hmm. it may not be exactly what you want you may not win principal flute of the Metropolitan Opera but um, you can create a life where you have constant growth and and as as much happiness as is yeah. as humanly possible. I love I love that positive message. It's great, mm-hmm. and you're sharing that with your students too. You you're teaching at Aspen, right? Or I'm teaching yeah. it at Aspen. And you stepped in at CCM, which is wonderful. Visiting assistant yeah. professor at. How's at it feel to be entrusted with that studio there? Oh my goodness! It's, it really is a dream uh, come true. It's just. I would say that if there was even the slightest thing that was difficult about it, you know, doing the, you know, the six hour trek from Seattle, always yeah. with a layover every week yeah. um, would be impossible. But it's not at all. The students are great. Um, um, they ultimately, they want to be great flutists. They want to be as the, they want to be the best that they can. And, uh, there was, as, as most of us know, there was some unfortunate yeah. circumstances. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you know, I 
they want to be as good as possible. I sent out an email when, you know, the world found out about the unfor- unfortunate circumstances. That's an understatement, by the way. Right, yeah. But when the world found out about it, and the email sub- had the subject line, Unity. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted all of us to, to stick together for, to, for the goal that we were all there for. I'm mm-hmm. there to make them as good as possible, and, they, and they're there to learn. Let's, let's focus on that, and, um, and assuming that we all love the flute, this will, once again, going back to just personal happiness, um, that's what you need you know, especially during difficult times, go to what you love. Yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit more about your trio, McGill, McHale trio. McGill, McHale, (laughs) Heido, the Met trio. It's easy to assume that you didn't have a hard time finding a clarinetist to play with, um, right? Your brother. Right. But how did you choose your pianist and what do you look for in a collaborative pianist? Well, um, Michael McHale is a wonderful, wonderful Irish pianist. And um, we all happen to share the same manager, uh, Miriam Yardumian. And she recommended Michael. She said, you know, I think you guys will hit it off. Um, my brother and I, you know, love playing together and play well together. We, You know, we grew up playing together. Um, and so we said, sure, let's, you know, and, and our manager set up a, a residency at Bowling, Bowling Green State University. And uh, it was because of our schedules, this was supposed to be at least a two-day residency, a two or three-day residency, but it was jammed into, I think, a single day. Um, so we didn't have a lot of time to rehearse the day of, and we were just meeting Michael McHale. And so we didn't actually have enough time to rehearse the entire program because uh, we had to go off and do these um, different events that were plan for us um and michael was just so cool about it he said yeah it'll be fine and i mean anthony and i we don't worry about that kind of thing mm-hmm. it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be great you pretty, you're both pretty laid back well when in, in, we're in a situation that that is beyond your control right, there's nothing else um to do. there's nothing else to <laughs> yeah. do and um M- michael fit right in in that regard and the concert was fun it was fun and the the level wasn't sacrificed at all because of the lack of time to rehearse and so that's that's that Mm -hmm. it's like we should we should do more of this Mm -hmm. so it's been great i absolutely love playing with them so you recorded an album so we recorded an album together yes and Mm -hmm. um hopefully there'll be more oh more in the future i hope so yes do you know what kind of repertoire you want to record oh that not yet um because the repertoire on this cd how is that all held together what's the cohesive theme right well um uh, the album uh portraits uh is a very personal personal album for all of us um i guess the entree of the album is portraits of links and a work by wonderful flutist composer Valerie Coleman from Imani Wins from me from Imani Wins and um and I mean all of us connected with it immediately musically we were just thinking this is a golden piece of work this is amazing we this needs to be on the album um Anthony and I definitely connected um with the work because we grew up with the works of Langston Hughes um we were taught about Langston Hughes as you know as um as a, a a black American that we can really look up to, who, you know, who did amazing amazing things, um, so that w- it was personal for us in that way, um, and um, there's a couple of Irish works on there that are obviously uh, very mean something very personal to Michael McHill as an Irishman, um, but I just feel that. That and in a very general sense, every work and album um, just simply moved us. And if if it moved us, then we and then we felt like we could actually uh, we had a voice that would uh, respectfully rep, uh, present these works. Um, it in a in a sense, every work is a portrait of of us of, of our voice. Mm-hmm. So. 
film. And you had Mahershala Ali narrating. How did that come into works? That's right. pretty fantastic. <laughs> that that is pretty fantastic. It was pretty fantastic, and um, uh, that is really thanks to the wonderful people at Sidi Records, who I just love. I I love people who, who dream big. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like let's ask this person. Right? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and let's ask because, an Academy Award winner. Right. I mean, you just. I mean, once, that's yeah. it's a also a great lesson. Yeah. You know, why not ask? Mm-hmm. You know, let them say no. Yeah. You know, it's great. If you're sincere about the project. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Did you get to meet him, or did he record that separately? Yeah, he recorded it separately. Um, we didn't get a chance to meet him, but. We are definitely eternally grateful. Mm-hmm. He just added so so much, and I mean, what a what a voice, what charisma, character. Maybe a live performance someday. With him. Boy, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess all we can do is ask. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Mari, for stopping in and chatting with me. Thanks for having me. Whether it's balancing the schedule of an orchestral season in Seattle, adapting to the long commute to teach his students in Cincinnati, or performing in recitals across the country, Damari is always forging ahead, looking towards the future. I, for one, can't wait to see what Damari does next. Thank you to Damari McGill. His playing for this episode featured Foray's Fantasy, recorded with the Seattle Symphony, and vocalese by Rachmaninoff from the album Portraits by the McGill Mikhail Trio. This has been an episode of Flute Unscripted. This podcast is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. Visit their website at flutesforsale.com for the largest selection of new and pre owned instruments. Use this season's promo code LISTEN for a special deal of $50 off any purchase of $4.99 or more. You can follow the Flute Center on Instagram and like them on Facebook to stay up to date on the latest events and masterclasses. Special thanks to our owner, Phil Unger, the Flute Center team, and Stefan Huskoldson for our theme music. <laughs>